Hello, I'm Amr Shahat. I'm Egyptian archaeologist specialized in plants and food remains from Egyptian tombs and sediments. I'm also research associate at the Kutzen Institute of Archaeology, University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome to People in the Past. What topic are we talking about today? Today, I'm speaking to you about Pelio Ethno Botany. Pelio means ancient, ethno people, and botany means plants. And basically, we speak about how plants shaped people's culture and health in the past. What sources or data do we look at? So, Pelio Ethno Botany investigates social history of past societies through close analysis of the cultural uses of plants in food, medicine, rituals, clothing, trade, and also in their cultural exchange network. And we find plants by two ways in archeological sites. First technique is called flotation. Basically we put soil that we take from the excavation sites, as you see here, and we pour the soil from the top and we pump the water from the bottom. So this water is connected here and it actually stirs the water softly and smoothly from the bottom up. So the plant remains have less density than the density of the water. And because of this density difference, the plant remains float on the top. And then they come out here in this small container that I take, I dry and put under the microscope to identify the ancient species of plants discovered from this site. And I have a song here in Arabic and in English that explains the process. Flotation, my friend, the flotation, so you don't lose any information. Zan, zan. And the other way to find archaeobotanical remains is called dry sifting. So we take the soil dry as it is, and we put it in multi-layer of sieves. And we put the bigger mesh size on the top and the smaller mesh size, like one millimeter and 0 0.5 millimeter down in the bottom. And the plants remain, the plant remains go down usually we find them in the two millimeter, one millimeter and half millimeter uh, mesh size of cells. After we do this, we also take the plants and put them under the microscope to identify them based on how they look anatomically and in terms of plant morphology. So basically this science is a combination of archeological science and plant science or botany. How can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? And this is an important question because every day each of us thinks about something healthy and delicious to eat or drink. A lot of scientific research also is concerned about the relationship between health and diet and the impact of climate change on healthy food supply to our community today. So today I'm excited to share with you lessons on healthy food derived from the past. And as an archaeobotanist, I study ancient cultures from the lens of food and how ancient populations use these plants in different recipes to mark their identity and to maintain their health. I'm going to take you to an example of a site called Nag Eder, dating to 3000 BC, means over 5000 year old in the south of Egypt, in Upper Egypt, as you see here. And it is north of Luxor, the famous site, as you see here. And the site is known for non-elite people who left behind no text, no record, no fancy coffins, but we still can have an idea about their lifestyle in terms of food and 
their health and their regional identity based on the variation of the recipes they have different than other regions in Egypt. So I'm excited to share with you the finding or a special finding from this site and speak about what a 5,000 year old beer buried in an Egyptian tomb like this tell us uh, about food and health of people in the past. So in this tomb, the archeologist discovered a jar that you see here with a handed jar. And he noted that he found oily, oily sed uh, sediment or basically sandy soil that he found, uh, oily soil. Uh, but he didn't leave any other notes or studied this soil and what it could be. So after the jar came to the Hearst Museum, of Anthropology in the University of California, Berkeley, I decided to do my research on this sandy sediment. And surprisingly, after putting it under the microscope, I found fragment of fermented barley. You can also see that the barley is deformed here because of being buried for thousands of years and also because of the process of fermentation uh, for beer making. Then to make sure that this beer and the seeds we see from this soil is actually ancient, I conducted carbon dating to make sure. And the carbon dates was around 3,600 BC. So this is basically over 5,000 year old beer mash. But how can this topic or material tell us about the life of people in the past? Well, beer was consumed as a main staple and nutrition in ancient Egypt. And sometimes it was safer than drinking pure water. Um, and because you consider filtering the water from impurities uh, and, and uh, other things, so it was sometimes safer to drink fermented beer than water. And in the settlement of the pyramid builders, archeologists Mark Lenner and his team have found the granaries and beer vats to supply food and drinks for the workers and also pay them in form of food ratio. But what do you think could be the difference between the ancient and modern beer? Was it? the more alcohol content, more better, more nutritious, different thoughts can come to our mind. But in my research, I use interdisciplinary methods, including nanotechnology, like using this microscope to identify the beer recipe, which was made of fermented barley, as we mentioned before, and like today's beer, but what is the difference then? This is where the second exciting part of my research comes in. The first difference is that the ancient beer was rich in fiber. The chaff of the grain that includes the fibers and vitamins was not totally removed, which we eventually find sometimes in the gut of mummies. But there is another surprise. The beer recipe also included wild fruits as natural sweetener and also rich in fiber. So kind of Harry Potter's sweet beer that people drink and tourists drink in Universal Studio in Los Angeles today. This is study of the beer and food remains from ancient Egyptian tombs also show that how ancient Egyptians exploited large biodiversity of wild plants in their diet, as you see in this image. They had different fruits. They didn't just rely on beer and barley, but they exploited different fruits from the region like sycamore fig, uh, Christ thorn, we call it nabak in Arabic, in Egypt, uh, dates, uh, persia fruits and grapes, but sometimes also they import different uh, plants like 
uh, watermelon as part of their interaction with other cultures. And in the case of watermelon, it's a part of interaction with Eastern Africa. Other fruits like pomegranate and juniper uh, reflects interaction with societies in the ancient Near East, uh, like Lebanon and Syria and other and Southern Levant. So the question now is what is the connection between high fiber content that we find in ancient Egyptian food and beverages like beer having fibers and wild fruits? Our modern society today, and especially the Western diet, besides being high in its sugar and fats content, is actually marked by its poor fiber consumption compared to the ancient population. Also, climate change endangers plant biodiversity, which comes with health impacts in the form of decline in our gut microbiota that maintains our immune system and mood health. And a lot of these plants that we find from archaeological record, unfortunately, either endangered or completely went extinct because of climate change, mainly, and other uh, issues of managing the Nile River and the agriculture cycle. In few words, what a 5,000 year old Egyptian beer tell us about healthy food and gives us lesson for our diet today is that the more, the more fiber intake and more diversity of plants you eat in your diet, the better gut and mood health you have like an ancient Egyptian. I would like to thank the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology and the Community Archaeology Initiative led by different faculty members there, especially the Bucciolatis family. And I would like to thank the American Research Center uh, in Egypt for their funding and support of this research. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for watching and thanks for peopling the past.